13. Matthew 13. Mm. Well, last week, you guys, if you weren't here, uh, you missed out. I mean, uh, Luis uh, just really served us remarkably well by helping us understand the purpose of parables. Now, this is important because we're about to get into a series of parable teachings by Jesus, and we need to understand the purpose of them. You know, there's a when you look at the, the outline of Matthew 13, it's kind of outlined a little odd. You get a parable that starts off, then Jesus does some explanation of why he talks about par- in parables. Then he explains the first parable, and then he goes back to another explanation of why he does parables, and it feels all jumbled. So what we try to do is say, okay, let's just put it together to talk why we do par- why Jesus did parables first, and then we'll talk about the actual parables. And, and, and there's so many profound things that Luis said last week. And if you, again, if you haven't listened to it, haven't watched it, get, get a hold of it. I think it'll really serve you, serve you well. But one of the things he said that I think is really important, there's many things he says is really important, but this, this is one of them, is, is uh, he just made this simple comment. Let's allow Jesus to tell us why he taught in parables and not assume why he taught in parables. Right, so we do this a lot. We read the Bible, and we kind of begin to make all these assumptions about why Jesus did what he did. But the reality of it is, Jesus explains why he taught in parables, which to me was profound because it just makes me again, drives me right back to the text of Scripture to say, what does God say? Right, and the reason why that's important is, you're going to be on your own someday in a very difficult trial of your life. You won't be able to get a hold of your husband, your wife, your friend, your pastor, whoever. And what do you have to remember? What does God say? What does God say? And it just reminds you to go right back to Jesus. He, he is the great shepherd of your soul, and he will explain to you why he's done what he's done. He does that in Scripture, and I love that about that point. There's another point about parables. As Luis taught, it just reminded me of, of some things in my life. A few years ago, as I was cutting my teeth on, on biblical counseling, it's probably, I don't know, 20 years ago, uh, Bill Hurd was my mentor. So when I started counseling people according to the Bible, Bill kind of came into my life, and Bill began to kind of send me people that he didn't have uh, an opening for, for me to counsel them. And I remember there was one particular friend of mine that I was counseling, and I was trying to get through to them this particular truth from the Bible. And, I, and, and if you know me, well, you know, you, you could probably, this is probably obvious, I, I, I just kind of keep hitting the same note, and if I don't get the same note, I kind of hit it a little harder right and then finally the intensity level picks up and i just kind of get a little louder thinking that if i get louder you'll understand it you know and uh and bill i went to bill one time i said look i've been meeting with this guy for months he's not getting it i was telling bill what the situation was and he says well how what are you doing and i I just telling him well i'm just telling him the truth you know just bringing the truth to him and he said hey when the door is shut look for a window and here's what he said find another way to say the same truth and here's then he added this little element Invest in this guy's life deeply enough that you understand what makes him tick and then make a word picture to speak the same truth. And I started investing in this guy and over time I began to realize how I could say the same thing, same truth, with a different way. A window. And that's what we see in Matthew chapter 13. Now my wife is remarkably gifted at parables. She's remarkably gifted at word pictures, not with you all, but with me. She's remarkably gifted at that, and several years ago during baseball season, uh, if you know much about our lives during baseball season, it is a bit of a zoo, and, um, and so we are, we are always trying to find moments where we can just sit down together, kind of have a debrief and talk about what's going on in life and where the world is and the whole thing, and one, one time she uh, sat me down, we were having a great time to talk, and she said, I've got a, que- I have a question for you. I said, sure. She says, I- I'm-, I'm just fascinated by this game. Of course, that again tells me I married the right woman. And I said to her, uh, in, in what, what aspect, sweetie? And she said, you know, how do you prioritize your batting lineup? I mean, you do it really well. I said, well, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I just, I mean, I was jazzed. I mean, you know, I get to explain to the woman I love about the game I love. And I said to her, well, here's what we do. We, we find the guy who we think can get on base and maybe is our best base runner. We put him number one. Number two, I want to put the guy that can handle the bat really well and move that guy who gets on base over a little bit. I want my best hitter at number three. I want my four guy to be a guy who maybe hit the ball in the ballpark. And I just kind of went through the lineup a little bit. She just goes, that, that is absolutely fascinating. And then she said this, where am I at in the priority of your batting order? <laughs> now, 
Now, y'all see what she did there, right? Right? Now, let's understand the dynamic in this. This is after a few weeks of saying, hey, I need a little time. Need a little time. Hey, hey, need a little time. So she knows me well enough to go, I'm going to get him alone. I'm going to give him a metaphor. I'm going to give him a parable. And I'm just going to slap him upside the face, right? I'm just going to pop him, right? Right between the eyes, right? And you can feel that in your heart, right? So that's what Jesus does with parables. And we've got to understand that. Jesus is, is this personal with these parables. He is right inside the society, inside this culture, knows exactly how to speak to them and what to say to them, and says, if you will, the same truth using a different method. Right? That's critical that we understand that. Okay, so let's, we're going to look at the very first parable this morning. It's called the parable of the sower. So stand with me. We're going to read Matthew 13, 1 through 9, and then we're going to skip down and read verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered around him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. And other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's go to verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. And for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Let's pray. Father, we stand because we are people that honor this book. It is inspired by God, it is God-breathed, and we are grateful that you have given us this word to declare to us who you are and to show us Jesus this morning father as we talk about the sower and the seed and and the soil I pray that you'd help us to be good soil that our hearts would be receptive and 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 eager to receive and cherish and treasure the word of Christ and we thank you we pray this in Jesus name amen Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. <clears throat> now, here's what we see in this parable. Jesus is going to tell us again who the true followers are in his kingdom. One of the things that you've noticed at the book of Matthew is that Jesus is laid out. There's no neutrality when it comes to him, right? You're either with him or you're against him. We've seen this over and over and over again. And here's what's beautiful about these parables you're going to find this to be true. There's no guesswork. Jesus does all the work for us, and if you're a preacher, you're really grateful for that, right? Because he explains to us what these parables mean. Now, here's what I want to look at this morning. I want to look at it really easily. I want to look at three soils that were fruitless. I want to look at one soil that was fruitful, and then I want to give us just a few things to take home and remember from the text so that we can see them, right? So let's just remember where we are in the book of Matthew We've just come out of Matthew 12 where there's been this rising conflict between Jesus and these Jewish religious leaders. They're, they're fighting over the fact that the Jewish leaders are mad that Jesus doesn't listen to their traditions and doesn't honor their traditions. They've even gone so far as calling him the son of the devil. 
I mean, we're, we're getting on some pretty crazy ground here. Jesus has made it clear throughout the book of Matthew. He has come to inaugurate his kingdom. He's the king of that kingdom. He's shown us evidence that he's the king of the kingdom. Matthew has laid out this case over and over and over and over again that Jesus Christ is the one we are to believe in, submit to, trust. He is the king. He's the one we've been waiting on. And so Matthew's been laying this case out. But Matthew 12 shows us that the Jewish leaders were saying not so much. We don't believe in him. We don't trust in him. We don't submit to him. And they've, they're going so far as they've already started, they're beginning to conspire to kill him. This is going to take place as we move forward in the book of Matthew. So as we come to Matthew 13, Jesus leaves that conflict in Matthew 12 behind, and he, he then goes out to the Sea of Galilee. Now, we don't know why. There's some explanation that he possibly went out there just to kind of get a breath of fresh air, you know, just to kind of breathe a little bit. He'd been in a house, a bunch of crowded people. You've ever been in a room like that? You want to get outside? He's probably just out by the sea, wanting to get a moment here of sanity, and a huge crowd gathers around him, and Jesus does what he normally does. He begins to teach him, and, he, and what he did was he crawled into a boat. You might go, now why do you do that? Well, he crawled into a boat to get out on the the, the water a little bit and if you know this area in the sea of galilee it's like a natural amphitheater now, i had the privilege of standing at this spot they thought that jesus taught here and i was at the very bottom near the water my closest associate i was with was at the very top of the hill maybe a hundred yards off i spoke in a normal tone of voice and he heard me like i was standing next to him the acoustics were dynamic so jesus is just using the acoustics of the water where he could speak to a very large crowd in this moment and he begins to teach them in ways that they clearly understand now understand something about this first century of uh, of israel this was an, an agricultural community agricultural society they understood agricultural terms very very well and all surrounding the sea of galilee in this area there were fields all over the place so not only was jesus talking about the sower they very well could have just turned around and seen some people out actually sowing. So he could have very naturally said, see that guy over there? This is what I'm talking about. The sower goes out to sow. Now, now you might wonder, why didn't they till up the ground or do certain things? They didn't have the luxuries that we have today to do what we do to our ground, right? They didn't have the, the luxury of rototilling a ground with a rototiller that you might own or go to United Rentals and get one. And some of them could not afford an ox, so what a lot of the sowers did was, not knowing what ground would bear fruit, they just started sowing seed everywhere. Literally every place they owned, they just throw down seed with the hopes of that seed would begin to take root and begin to, uh, begin to bring some produce. Now notice with me as we look into this, this parable, notice the main point of this parable. You're going to notice some things about this parable. Notice, you'll notice that there's very little discussion on the sower we're introduced to the sower in in verse 3 but there's very little said about the sower now the assumption is this sower is the son of man or the son of god and the assumption is later it's all those who follow him that go sow seed very little discussion about the sower you'll also notice there's very little discussion about the seed we're entered we're told though in verse 19 something fascinating about the seed we're told that when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and in the verses that follow that that same word for word is used throughout Now, this is a critical piece of evidence but it's not discussed a ton and the reason it's not discussed is because it's assumed that we would already know the word of the kingdom has been this savior jesus coming and revealing i'm inaugurating a kingdom i'm here i'm the king this is all the evidence of my kingdom and this is how my people are to live matthew 5 through 7 as we went over the sermon on the mount and so it's an assumed idea that they would understand what the word of the kingdom was about we could say it this way with biblical clarity the seed is the word of god it is the whole counsel of god that displays to us and tells us that jesus is the king and savior of god's kingdom it's 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 it tells us how we as his people are to submit and live underneath his rule and reign over all things so there's very little said about the seed we're introduced to it it's, it comes up every now and then 
But what you're going to notice, though, is almost all of the discussion, almost all of it, is about different soils. Now, verse 19 tells us that the different soils are actually the hearts of men. Actually, the hearts of men. And the response or the receptivity of each heart to the word of the kingdom, to that seed, will be evidenced by what fruit comes out of that soil or that heart. We could say it another way. The way we hear and receive the word of God the gospel, the word of Christ's kingdom and authority reveals what type of heart or soil that we have. So this parable in reality, let's look at what this parable is. This parable is about receiving. It's about hearing. It's about embracing. It's about cherishing. It's about treasuring things. That's what it's about. And what this tells us is the same thing that Jesus has been telling us all throughout the book of Matthew. Right? Right? The issue with the Jewish leaders is not the sower. The issue with the Jewish leaders is not the seed. The issue with the Jewish leaders is the soil of their hearts. That's what Jesus is going after here. Now, guess what it's going to do to us? It's going to leave us in the same boat. We're going to realize, wait, the king is here. He's given a word of truth. The real question is, how are we handling it? What's the soil of our hearts? What are we embracing and cherishing and treasuring about Jesus and his word? That's the question of this parable. That's the, that's the point that's being driven home here out of this parable. So with that said, let's look at the three soils that are fruitless. Three soils that are fruitless, and, and we'll go through these rather quickly here. The first soil is the one along the path. where the seed gets sown and the birds of the air come and take it away. And we could call this soil the hardened heart. Now, if you have done any hiking in the state of Oregon, you know exactly what this looks like, right? It's a pathway that many people walk on. It's about three feet wide. And you throw out seed on that and birds will come and just snap. It does not, nothing germinates in it. It's hard as a rock. You can't get anything in there. Nothing gets in there to begin to take root. And the birds just come and snatch it away. It's really easy to deduce that the soil that Jesus is talking about is the hardened heart. This represents people who don't want to hear the word of God, don't want to hear the word of Christ. They might give us a listen out of respect for us, but they really don't care to apply or receive or embrace anything that we have to share. Now, according to verse 19, and you'll see this very clearly, the devil and his minions come along the way, and what do they do? They snatch away that seed, so there's not a chance at all of that seed taking root. These people are unresponsive, they're blinded, they're darkened, and they're captivated by Satan to do his will. And to be honest, if we're honest with ourselves, this is what makes the gospel so beautiful, is that every one of us are in this place without the work of God doing something. Every one of us are. Okay? That's the first soil. But then there's a second soil, which is the rocky soil. Now, we might call this the impulsive or emotional heart. Now, we can say this because notice what happens in this soil. Right? It immediately, the seed immediately springs up and endures, maybe even says, for just a little while. Meaning this person receives it joyfully and it seems promising but look at the end result immediately falls away it's gone as quickly as it came now you have to ask some questions on this why why does that happen why why does a seed they receive it yet it just immediately springs away well again we don't there's no guesswork jesus tells us he says they had no depth of soil nor do they have any root in themselves. Meaning, this person receives it emotionally. They make a decision without giving any thought to how they're going to move forward in this decision. There's no depth of soil. That's why, listen, you could create a church that's a mile wide and a thimble deep, and you're going to miss out on a lot of truly converted Christians. That's why we are passionate, passionate about this book deepening us and the soil, because the, the, the seed has got to get deep 
and take root. There's reasons for that. There's no depth, no root. Now the truth is, what happens in that shallowly rooted seed that begins to pop up immediately, you know what happens, right? I mean, if the winds come, what happens to a, a tree that has no root? It's getting knocked over. What happens to a, a small little plant that just kind of pops up, has no root, and the sun just scorches it away? And that's what happens when the storms of life and the trials of life and the pressures of persecution of the, because of the kingdom of God come our way. A shallow-rooted heart will give up, walk away, and bag it every time. Every time. Now listen, we all know people like this. Or maybe, listen, we're, we're like this. Right? And this is where we've got to really do some work here. I mean, we go to a camp, that week-long summer camp, and we get all just spiritually jacked. And within about a month, we're, we're back in the pit. Things aren't like they, I thought they were going to be. We go to a revival meeting. We hear some preacher give us a great sob story. We come down to the front to repent of our sin, finally get right with Jesus again because Jesus is going to make my life better. He's going to make everybody around me get better. And suddenly the storms of life hit and the people that we love don't like what we believe. And what do we say? I'm out. Thought this was going to be easier. Thought this was going to be blessing and all the words that our society uses about how Christian people are to live, this beautiful thing. This person might even look good for just even a little while, but without root or depth. Listen, it will not last. It will not last. The scorching heat of life will burn whatever small leafling was left was present. It will be gone just as quickly as it came. Now I find... These types of people that Jesus is talking about here, these are the most difficult types of people to figure out in the Christian life. I think, and I'm wondering, if that's why Jesus spent more time talking about them. It's the longest explanation that he uses in the text. Because these are the most difficult ones. There's always that question, are they a Christian or not a Christian? I mean, what are we, what are we doing with these people? How, where, where, I mean, they're, they're in and out all the time. Bad things happen and they're out. Good things happen and they're in. What is the deal with these kind of people? Well, Jesus is clear. These folks will end up fruitless. They have no root. They seem to get excited, but they will fizzle out. That's the second root, the second ground, second soil. It's the rocky soil. Pops up, excited, really jazzed for a few moments. Got a, maybe a few years of zeal, and then just bad things happen. They just brrr, fizzles right out. The third soil is the soil among the, the weeds. We could call this the distracted soil. This person hears the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word, and it becomes fruitless. I mean, you, you know what this looks like. It's like trying to plant a nice grassy field right in the middle of berry vines. Right? You know what I'm talking about? You plant any kind of grass seed among berry vines, what do berry vines do? They take over everything. Right? They dominate the whole thing. And, and that's what happens. The grass doesn't grow. The vines take over. And we all know people like this. You know, we know a friend, right? You know what I'm talking about? I'm asking for a friend, which is really, I'm asking about myself. We all know people like this. And maybe some of us are this way. They hear the word of God. And what they hear is this. Listen clearly. Jesus will make me a better person, a better accountant, a better athlete, a better business person, a better entrepreneur, a better lawyer, a better this, a better that. He'll make my wife better, make my kids better. He'll make this better. He'll make my, finan my finances go up. He'll make my health better. And all those things to some degree might be true because he does at certain moments. But notice the unusual angle of the distracted person. Their career or their riches or their desires are what they treasure. And Jesus is a tool, not a king. That's a big difference. It's a big difference. I remember clearly the day when I was sitting in the very back of an auditorium with 5,000 students while a guy named Dawson McAllister was up preaching about vocational Christian ministry. I was 18 years old. It was June after my high school graduation. I was heading off to a university to go play high, uh, college baseball. And as I was sitting in the very back, I was there for one reason and one reason only. That was to play softball and win that championship, which we did. And then as well, to get as many phone numbers, as many girls as I could get which I did. And 
the Lord said in that moment, you are supposed to preach the gospel for a lifelong work. And I sat there and I said, this ain't, this ain't going to work. I walked down front, looked at my pastor, and I said, look, they told me to come down here. I think the Lord told me I'm supposed to preach the gospel with my life. And he said, yeah, I've known that since you were 11 years old. Didn't want to tell you, but that's what you're supposed to do. And I said, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. I'm, I'm going to play college baseball, and I'm moving further down that road. That's where I'm going. He said, no, you, you don't get it. <laughs> See, in my mind, I said, okay, here's what I, said. I even said. Here's what I'll do. I, I surrender to that, whatever that is, but here's what's going to happen. I'll let Jesus just make me a better baseball player. Then when I arrive, then I'll use that to honor him. Well, it looks like God won. But you see the angle. The angle was, I want to be this. Jesus, you come along for the ride and you be the tool that I use to get there rather than, no, wait a second, I'm the king. I will determine what you do and how you do it and when you do it. And that's submission. Heard years ago, a guy make a comment. He was a pastor in Romania when the communist walls were up. And I thought this was fascinating. He said, Americans love the word commitment. You know what commitment is? Commitment is you can see all that's on the page, read over it, even negotiate, and then sign. He said, that's not surrender. Surrender is the page is blank. We sign on the bottom line and we say, Lord, do whatever you wish and write whatever you want. That's different. The distracted individual wants to see what's on the page. Then I'll sign up. Then I'll do it. And notice what happens to this distracted person. And by the grace of God, as of yet, my life has not ended up there. Thank God. Praise God for the grace of God to win the day, to move me where he wants me. This parable in this reminds us that the Bible speaks so firmly over and over again against selfish ambition, the love of money, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. All of those things do what? They choke out the truth of God's word from taking root in our heart. This is why we're told to beware of loving the world from pursuing the things of the world and living by the philosophies of the world. This is why Jesus told us we cannot love God or money because we can't serve two masters. One master will choke out the other master. You know, you notice something about each of these three soils. They're all fruitless. Every one of them is fruitless. Meaning all three soils represent people that are not Christian people. They might show some sign of it, but it doesn't last. And there's one thing, though, that you'll notice that these people must do that are in this category. In any of these three categories, they need to repent, submit, and trust Jesus. See, here's where we just got to stop for a moment just, and just say, Lord, where, where, which, do any of these soils represent my heart? Do any of these represent me? I mean, right, are you, are you the hardened individual that just, listen, you just don't want to hear it? You just don't want to hear it. You're here because your mom and dad have drugged you. You're here because your friend has finally got into your ear and they're going to take you to lunch later. That's how you got here. We're glad you're here, but are you the hardened individual? You're the person that just says, look, I'm tired of it. I would just say to you, listen, turn to Christ. Trust Jesus. Stop resisting. Stop being hardened. Maybe, maybe for you, you, you've noticed and you've seen that pattern in your life. You know, you get excited about things. You get joyful about things. And things kind of have to be that spiritual high moment for you all the time. You know what I mean by those moments? That camp high experience. So everywhere you go, you're always looking for it. So the latest, greatest conference, the new thing, maybe the greatest prophet on the world's got to speak something to you, and you're looking for that all the time. But when the valleys of life hit, you wonder, where'd your faith go? What happened? Can I just say something to you? Don't, don't miss, that's like a blinking light on your dashboard of your car saying, something is wrong. Something's there. Not, I'm not talking about those, those, those sudden moments where you just kind of get shaken a little bit about God's goodness and you kind of come out of it. We know those moments, right? I'm talking about a regular, ongoing willingness 
to walk away from the things of God every time something bad happens. Or every time persecution hits. Or every time the pressure gets on, we suddenly begin to wilt regularly on purpose. We cannot miss that warning sign. So what do we need to do? We need to say, Lord, listen, I don't want you just to sustain me. I want you to deepen me so much into the grace of God that the goodness of God, the wonder of Christ, the beauty of Christ captivates my soul. But are you the distracted soil? See, this is where I think the danger is for us. This church, the distracted soil. We are... We are high-pursuing individuals. And it's easy, isn't it? We all know this. It's easy that the cares of the world, the busy schedule, the life, the pursuit, the business things, all the stuff around us begin to just pull us every different direction. And we feel that. Is the pursuit of comfort, the comfort of this world pulling you from your devotion to Jesus? I mean, all you, look, you just, look, I just want some comfort, man. Can I just... Can we just find, I just, I just want to get to the end of my work life and be able to just bag it all and get out of here. Our business pursuits, sports accolades, being the world's greatest parent. Where everybody looks at you and goes, boy, your kids are just something, right? And that kind of does something in you. Is that all choking out the seed of the word of Christ? Well, what should be our response? Our response is, hey, Lord, we just... I just want to submit to you. I want to submit my interest to you. I want to say to you, Lord, if, if this is an interest you don't want me in, take it. Take it. Now let's look at the one soil that's fruitful. One soil that's fruitful. And this one's pretty easy to follow. It's good soil. It receives, it embraces, it cherishes the seed, it produces fruit. And you'll notice it produces some 30, 60, or 100 fold, meaning it's producing fruit over and over and over and over and over again. Now, Jesus tells us that this soil is the person who hears and understands the word of Christ, meaning they have ears to hear and they get it. They understand it. They, they're clinging to it. They have spiritual eyes that see and they have spiritual ears that hear. And when this happens, he says, fruit happens. When the seed takes root, fruit happens. They are fruitful people. Now, what's fascinating about this is there can be a case that these might be three different soils. A 30-fold soil, a 60-fold soil, and a 100-fold soil. Could be. Some would say, well, these are just one soil. Makes no difference. What I want you to notice is they're fruitful no matter what. Whatever it is, they're fruitful. I want you to see they are producing fruit. They, em they embrace his word. They cherish him. They submit to him. And the result is he's at work within them to produce all varieties of fruit and all varieties of sizes of fruit. Some produce smaller amounts. Some produce larger amounts. But they're all producing fruit. And what you notice is you don't see in this... In this uh, parable any comparison between the soils you know jesus say the 30-fold soil looked over the 100-fold soil and said boy i really wish i was a hundredfold right doesn't say that at all there's no comparison the fact is they're producing fruit now you've got to ask then what does that fruit look like what does scripture say would be fruit that would come out of a soil or a heart that is receptive that is embracing the word of Christ and cherishing it. Let me just give you a few things. This is not exhaustive. These are a few. There will be a personal conviction of sin because the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. There will be something in you that suddenly begins to go off about certain things you used to think were okay that are now not okay, that you realize, oh, wait a minute, I, I, I may be goofing up here. Remember years ago, a young man receiving Christ, and he came to me and he says, I have a question. Is sex before marriage a sin? I said, it is. He says, okay. All right, I'll stop having sex with my girlfriend. I said, great. That's a good plan. He said, I never knew that. I said, well, how did you know that? He said, I don't know. Something in me told me I need to stop. So I thought I'd ask you. I said, good call. That's the Holy Spirit, bud. Let's be happy about that, right? The Holy Spirit's going off to say to him, stop sinning. There's also going to be a desire 
to worship Jesus, to honor Jesus, to glorify Jesus and be with his people. There's a desire to tell others about Jesus, to proclaim to them the ones you love and about the one you love. This is the one I believe. This is what's happened to me. I can't explain it all. I just know that I've been changed and transformed. I've been forgiven of my sin. You need to as well. There's a growing passion to be like Jesus, right? You want to be more loving. You want to be more joyful. You want to be more self-controlled. You want to be patient, right? Those are fruit. Now, this doesn't mean we've arrived or that our fruit is, per- is perfect, right? It doesn't mean that every time something bad happens that we're not good soil. It just means, listen, we're, we're, we're in, we're in sanctification mode here. We're producing sometimes this tenfold fruit, 30 fold fruit. But notice there is fruit being revealed. And if there's fruit being revealed, listen, here's what you got to do. You got to rejoice. I have people all the time say, man, I feel so bad about my sin And I just feel like I'm not a Christian. And I say to him, listen, if you feel bad about your sin, be happy. You're a Christian. You're in the fight. Because if you weren't a Christian, you wouldn't feel bad at all. I mean, we know this battle, don't we, as parents? I mean, you've got this, you know, four-year-old son you're trying to raise, and he is a nutcase. I mean, you know, it's like, what demon got inside that kid sometimes? You're like, what happened? All the sins being exposed. I remember uh, one of our kids one time, we were at some friends' houses. It was one of our young lads, and he's out <laughs> swinging with a batting tee, and he swung and missed. And he grabbed the batting tee and the bat and threw them both over the fence. Boom! And just started screaming at him. And I was like, what? What, ju- what just happened here? I said, there's little David York running in the back room. of the. What is he doing? And Jill says, oh, we got some work to do. That young man now would never dream of doing that. There's little fruit along the way. And we had to keep our mind with this idea. Little bits of fruit. We just went. We'd get quietly and go, yeah, I thought it was a little fruit. The gospel's at work. Let's do, it's awesome. Right? I mean, if you see a little bit of fruit, it might be, listen, I mean, you know, there's an old saying in Texas. We say, if you want to go fast, get on your horse. Your kid might be on their turtle. And if they're on their turtle and it's moving, then just, thank you, Jesus, there's movement, right? Amen. Amen. Listen, wives, wives, your husband might be on his turtle. It's okay. But if you see fruit, oh, Jesus is at work, right? You see the point here. We, we've got to understand if there's fruit, there's to be rejoice and be glad because make no mistake. Listen, make no mistake. There must be fruit. There must be fruit to reveal that the root has taken place. I have people tell me all the time, my faith is personal and it's private. And I say to them, listen, your faith is personal, but it should never be private. And here's what I mean by that. Anybody of you seen the old Disney movie, The Invisible Man? How many of you have seen that movie? Just raise your hands. Like five of us in the room, great. This analogy will go over poorly. The Invisible Man, you couldn't see him when he was in the room until he put on a top hat, a coat, and glasses. Then he'd take all that off and he'd sneak in rooms. Nobody knew he was there. But when he put on his glasses, his little hat, and his coat, everyone went, that guy's in the room. Faith is that, is invisible, without the top coat, the hat, the glasses, and the hat. When we're seeing fruit, it's revealing faith. And you cannot see faith without fruit. So make sure you understand this. Three soils in this parable are not Christian people. One soil is. And this fits perfectly with what Jesus has been saying in Matthew, that there is no neutrality with him. There's no messing around with Jesus. You're either in or you're out. You're either for him or against him. He's made this really clear throughout our time together in this book. So we've got to see this really clearly. Three soils that are fruitless, one that is fruitful. Now let me give you three things, bless you. One things, three things from this parable that I want you to remember. I don't want you to forget three things from this parable. First, notice, I want you to notice that this parable says that while God acts, we must respond. See, this is what I want you to hear from me, all right? 
Luis last week did a fabulous job of showing us how Jesus is, when Jesus sows the seed of the word of Christ, it, sometimes it hardens people. And it takes the act of God to move in them. And sometimes it softens people. And here's what happens. People get really wigged out by these words, election and predestination. We get all worked up and all freaked out about these words. Can I just say, can we stop it? You know why? All that is, is is just showing us what goes on behind the, the veil of eternity. That's all it is. It does not take away one ounce of the choices you have to make every day of your life that make that matter to every part of your life. All it does is make you realize when things happen in life, there's a God who's good and he cares for me and I know that. And then when I share the gospel, I can trust his sovereign God to go to work through the gospel. But every day of your life, you got to you better get out of bed or else you got problems to make. Right? You got to get you got to make choices that have real effects. God acts we must respond. God is the one who acts behind the scenes in the hearts of men. But listen, that does not mean that the hearts of men are to be unresponsive. The biblical truth is this. God acts, we must respond. And the way we know God has acted is when we respond. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For you know it is God at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. You act, and as you act, you suddenly look back and go, oh, God's been at work the whole time. We don't sit around and go, I wonder if God's going to be at work so I can go act. That's not what this is about. It's very clear. God acts, and we must respond. So listen, if you're here, you're watching, or you're listening online, listen, you must respond to Christ. You must submit to Jesus. You you must give your life to Christ to be considered forgiven and reconciled with God and a child of God. You must repent. God acts. We must respond. But there's another point of this for us as Christians that we, we can't miss about God's action and our response. Do you notice that the sower sows everywhere? Do you notice this? Just throwing out seed. Everywhere he goes, it's sowed broadly. You know what that is? That is the kindness of God to, do, to utilize what we call the general call of people to repent. So everywhere we go, every walk of life, every sphere of life, every neighbor, friend, or coworker, God is not discriminate on where the sower sows the seed. This means that we, like the Son of God before us, we should be sowing broadly. God, God is, listen, God is, is, has not put you in your neighborhood just because you have nice friends around you. He's providentially put you in a neighborhood to represent Jesus in that neighborhood. He's put you in a cubicle in your job to represent Jesus in that job. He's put you next to that logger near that log deck to be able to do what? Represent Jesus in your job. He's put you in the school you're in providentially to represent Jesus in your school. Every facet of where God places us in his kindness and providence is for us to be demonstrators and proclaimers of his glorious gospel. So listen, we must first respond with faith and trust in our king, but secondly, we need to respond by being like him and just sowing seed broadly. In our own way, in our own abilities, in our own field, in our own soils. Remember, some are 30, some are 60, some are 100. But what are we doing? We're just sowing seed. So that everywhere we go, people are at least smelling the aroma of Christ. For some, it smells really good like life. For others, it smells like the stench of death. And so everywhere we go, we're sowing seed. So God acts, we must Respond. The second thing I want you to walk away from and remember is this, that you have a real adversary. You can't miss this in the text. We have a real adversary. And, and his work is especially done in those who are the hardened soil. John MacArthur put it this way when talking about the devil's work in this parable. And I found this fascinating. He said this, Satan wants to make sure it, is never, it never has a chance to penetrate. 
He snatches it away to the influence of false teachers. He snatches it away to the fear of man. He snatches it away through pride. He snatches it away through doubt. He snatches it away through prejudice. He snatches it away through, or through stubbornness. He snatches it away through procrastination. He snatches it away mostly through the love of iniquity. But make no mistake, he snatches it away. So I want you to understand that. Friends, this is the real reason why people are hardened. It's their own sin, but we have an adversary who is doing everything he can, no different than what he did at the Garden of Eden. The moment God gave the word to Adam about what he needed to do, he slipped over to Eve and said, did God really say? This enemy is constantly at work trying to undermine the word of Christ everywhere he goes for the point of doing one thing, getting people to mistrust and dishonor the word of Christ and disbelieve it. That's the adversary you're up against. And so don't, don't be shocked by that. Rather, here's what you should do. You should be praying against that adversary. And in these moments that you are wanting to share the gospel or sow the seed broadly, you need to be asking, God, would you, just wherever the enemy goes to work, would you not snatch this, have him not snatch this seed away? Would you let the seed take root in this soil? And pray against him, but also, listen, work against him by doing what? Sowing the seed broadly. Right? You have a real adversary. Don't miss that. It's so easy to forget we have an adversary when we live in the comfort of Roseburg. I mean, we, you know, it's a nice little town. Not many bad things happen here. Did a couple, you know, last year, October 1st. But, you know, by and large, we're pretty comfortable fo folk. This is not Hobbiton. We have enemies. And there's one main enemy. And he's after the souls of men. And guess who we are? We are people who are out sowing the seed broadly. And he's going to snatch that seed wherever he can. There's one last lesson from this that I don't want you to miss. This parable tells us that long-term faithfulness and fruitfulness is Christian success. Long-term faithfulness and fruitfulness is Christian success. Did you notice there's only one soil that Jesus described as fruitful and successful? And it's the one that's producing fruit over the long haul. Right? This is what some would call the perseverance of the saints. Those who endure to the end are those who are genuinely saved. They are producing fruit over the long haul. The seed sticks into the soil and is producing fruit over the long term. Now, this is why this is critical. Because immediate success, immediate fruit that just pops up does not show us anything. Yet... We are mesmerized by it in our culture. We love grand openings, right? Roseburg is the queen of grand openings. I mean, we've got grand openings all the time. And I look back, I've been, over, I've been here now 20 years, so I can see grand openings through the years and now drive by those shops and they're all done. They're all closed. You know what I'm talking about? Mike, you've been here forever. <laughs> Sorry, you've been here a long time. Mike knows that. <laughs> we're, the key, we're the queen of it. We love to see immediate pass, pop up, glitz, glamour. Here it is, fruit happening everywhere. And then let's just ask the question, where is it in 30 years? Where is it in 50 years? Where is it in 100 years? See, long-term fruit reveals Christian success. We can't miss this. So here's what you have to be asking. And I don't... And I'm not asking us to be internal people who are navel-gazing all the time. You know, we're just looking down at ourselves and looking internal. But you do have to ask a question periodically, do I see fruit? Do I see any movement from where I was to where I am today? Is there fruit? And you know who the last person normally is to see fruit? You. That's why you need a community of people around you. You need people around you. When you can go, you can go and just say to them, hey, can I ask some questions? I, I am struggling with seeing fruit. What do you see? I'm not asking you to puff me up. I don't want to be arrogant or proud. I just need some help. And they'll say, well, yeah, I can look back and go here, 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 and here. Great, thank you. You need objective people to just speak that into your life. Listen, do you see any fruit? Do you see progress? Do you see that you're better at some things than you were several years ago? 
Is your representation of Christ growing in the places that you are? Is your influence growing where you have the ability to be able to speak into people's lives and you're using that as an opportunity for the gospel? Are you more willing now to engage in the lives of others for the sake of Christ than you were five, ten years ago, five months ago? Is there progress happening? Long-term faithfulness, long-term fruit matters to God because it reveals something. Now, I want to close because I want to, I want to close by letting Jesus speak to us about this. Because he does. In John 15, which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Jesus is talking about the fact that we are the branches and he's the vine. And he says that, that we, like branches, should be connected to the vine. Because the vine produces life in us and it does something in us. Well, notice what Jesus says in John 15, and it's going to come up on the screen. He says, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. By this, my Father is glorified. Now look at this phrase, that you bear much fruit. And... So, by bearing much fruit, prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, look at this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. You know, you notice from this, as it says up on the screen, we can't produce fruit outside of Christ. We can't produce fruit without the life-giving nourishment of our vine pumping his life and fruit-producing power through us. Christ producing fruit through us then, what does it do? It glorifies God. And it proves, it tells everybody around that that's God's people. Right there, those are Jesus' people. I recognize they're the ones who have been with Christ. And when that happens, and it happens in us, and it happens through us, notice what Jesus does. This is fabulous. His joy will be in us, and notice what he says. Our joy will be overflowing. You know what this says? It's fascinating. That when we decide to just stop looking at all that's on the page and and give ourselves in the writing and just surrender to the king. The king says, everything you're looking for, every joy, every peace, everything you're hoping for is found. Stop trying to control your life, submit to your king, and what does your king do? Your king produces in you his own joy. I mean, isn't it weird to you that the joy of Jesus is your joy? Not your joy comes from Jesus, but Jesus' joy gets in you when you're producing fruit, when you're honoring Christ and you're abiding in this vine. That's fabulous news. So here's what we need to do as people. Listen, I, I know you really well. I know this. You, you want to be people, you want to be producing thousand-fold fruit. I love that about you. But let's be honest. Some of us here, including the one speaking, we're about tenfold fruit bringers. Let's be glad there's fruit. But let's be people who want to produce more. By doing what? Abiding in this vine. Right? Not on our own, because we don't want the, our own to be honored. We want the Lord to be honored. We want Him to be seen in our world. We want God to be glorified. So let's pray for God-exalting, disciple-proving, joy-inducing fruit. Right? Don't you want that? I want that. I want when when fruit is done, Christ is glorified. It proves I'm his. And better yet, I I get this this joy that begins to be just um, full of glory. Let's ask God to help us be these people that, listen, have receptive hearts. That we just continue to let this seed take root in our souls. Let's be those kind of people. Let's pray.